Okay, we are already in time. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Before we begin our seminar, we'd like to remind you that we have simultaneous interpreting in Spanish and in English. Uh, you can access uh, the icon at the lower right area of your screen to select the language that is of best convenience to you. Well, I would like to welcome to the continuance of the series of seminars to strengthening uh, uh, capacity building for Latin America and the Caribbean on food safety systems. This is su su supported by the Phytosanitary Office of Ecuador in representation of Ecuador as the president and coordination of Codex for Latin America and the Caribbean CELAC and jointly with the regional office of FAO Latin America and the Caribbean, we're both uh, jointly in participating in a joint organization with the act financed by the Republic of Korea. The series of webinars that will be maintained until the year 2026 is to socialize and promote the standards of Codex Alimentarius uh, for inequity of uh, food safety in our region. During the year 2022, we took on the first two modules. Uh, the first one was a guideline with the new participants and the second module with fundamental text. This year, we continue with three new models. Um, the first one, which calls our meeting, which is the future and uh, food safety. Uh, the amount of information that the challenges that we consider that our future are already part of our present, our daily lives. And so we have to act quickly to be able to have the information and have it at our disposal. I am Maria Jose Los Angeles Gatita. I am part of uh, Act FAO and I have uh, Daniela Viveros, who is also from uh, CESELAC. So the floor is yours, Daniela, so that we can continue on the process. Thank you, Maria. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I am part of this welcome to this webinar. We already have 75 people, and we are increasing in the amount of um, interest in the aspects related to codex in the region. And to organize the webinar, we would like you to write your country, your name, uh, in this case, Ecuador, Daniela Viveros, and keep your microphones off or muted. Now we will begin for this module. We have three experts that will take on the futures and the challenges of uh, food safety, both from our world and regional standard and viewpoint. We will have a moment for Q&A where you can raise your hand and you will be given the floor. You can also write your questions on the chat that we will read at the end of the presentation. We would like to remind you that this webinar is going to be recorded so that we can share it with you and those that are not able to make it today. This is why we would like uh, you to keep in mind and be connected to our reports. Angela. Thank you, Daniela. We will now begin with Dr. Um, Leonora with FAO, and then we will have Claudio Guzman and Madame um, Gibson from Venezia. Dr. Uh, Dupuy has been at FAO since 2009. Her areas are promotion and support of political world regional uh, aspects related to food safety, related to national control on food, on the risk analysis, the preparation of emergency responses to food safety, improved capacity building for institutions in support of the Codes Alimentaris. Madame Dupuy uh, analyzed the priorities of, for uh, FAO and that which relates to food safety in the 2022-2031. She's part of the Secretariat of FAO and represents the application for standards, trade and STVIF. Before she became a part of FAO, Madame Dupuy was in the uh, academic area in science and nutrition, um, reform and modernization of 
uh, teaching food safety and nutrition. Please, the floor is yours. And thank you very much. And welcome to the series of webinars. Yes, thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction. And um, I apologize that I will make my presentation in, uh, in English. So first of all, I would like to greet um, all distinguished participants and uh, dear colleagues who are uh, connected uh, to this webinar. So, and also to, to thank to the FAO um, Regional Office for Latin America and Caribbean for inviting for the invitation to, to talk uh, in this um, uh, regional webinar. So the topic uh, which was been um, proposed is uh, food safety challenges to address in the near future. The uh, presentation uh, will highlight uh, key drivers of agri-food systems with impact on food safety. Also, we will look together to major food safety challenges to address and also uh, to at next steps, including expectations from uh, national authorities. Um, so as, as uh, all know, the global agri-food system operates uh, in a continuously evolving context, characterized by globalized food trade, changing markets, and interconnectedness of countries across regions. Uh, we have also pressure on food systems from raising population, urbanization, and raising food demand. We face also food system fragility from climate change, emergencies of various nature with potential to affect food safety and food supply, including we have recent lessons from COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, while it, it was not a foodborne disease, and nevertheless has had some implications for the operation of uh, food supply. Um, we also face evolving and emerging food safety hazards and issues which bring and involve much unknown uncertainty and require growing attention to food safety. We definitely need more resilient, sustainable and safe food supply at all scales, local, national, regional, global. So let's look together what are food safety challenges to address in the near future. Um, the FAO. Um, I'm so, Eleonora, so I'm yes. so sorry to interrupt. Maybe yes. you forgot to. We can't see your presentation. Yes. Uh, we can't. I don't know if you are using it already or. Ah, you do not see. It. <laughs> I'm okay, so okay. sorry. So I will uh, then uh, again um, share it. Share yeah, the please. screen. Maybe it happened something with sharing. Share. You see now. Yeah, I, we can see it. Uh, you just have to put it in, in full screen, please. Yes, we'll try. Okay. Perfect, thank now, you so much. Okay, this is a already past outline, what we have now with our global agri-food systems. And, and then it's about what are those um, food safety challenges to address and which we will describe in this uh, presentation uh, more, in, more in length. I don't know now, it is not moving. It is not moving the slides. I, no, I, I can see your, uh, you're trying to. Yeah, OK, now there it is. is. OK, so um, at the headquarter, FAO headquarter in uh, food, uh, food System and Food Safety Division, we have a foresight program, which have undertaken a foresight exercise um, uh, two years ago and last year. Uh, we uh, this process has culminated with a publication for site report and uh, this um, analysis or for site report uh, have identified major drivers and trends 
relevant to agri-food system and food safety, which include uh, technological innovation and scientific advances, urbanization and urban agriculture, circular economy, microbiomes and food safety perspectives, new food sources and food production systems, climate change, and also consumer behavior and food consumption patterns. These uh, major drivers and trends have been identified through a process which consisted from, um, first of all, uh, finding and collecting um, the information, the relevant information from various sources, such as scientific journals, a news release, information from partners, and also monitoring specific websites. The collected info information has been analyzed also using some uh, prioritization criteria, such as uh, implications for food safety, also likelihood, and uh, also scale and uh, novelty. And according to this uh, criteria, the, the major drivers and trends, which you see on this uh, slide, has been, um, let's say, prioritized. And it is um, anticipated that um, if these uh, major drivers and trends will be addressed, then they will support the transformation of agri-food systems according to the expectation of the 2030 agenda and will contribute effectively to sustainable development goals. And here you have um, the picture, the, the, the cover page of this report and also the link, uh, the web links to, to the, um, the foresight report. So what, what are drivers and what are trends? Drivers are macro level factors that derive from a broad spectrum of areas, including societal, environmental, technological, political, and economic. And trends are recognized the manifestation of drivers, um, keeping in mind that multiple drivers can concurrently cause or affect a trend and uh, vice versa, multiple trends can be traced back to a single driver. Uh, so here on the um, um, right side, you can see an example of how uh, this approach um, has been used in the FAO food, uh, foresight report. For example, uh, th three drivers, including population growth, climate change, and resource depletion, have um, conducted to the trend and have motivated to explore new food sources, including edible insects. Once the um, trend is identified, then uh, the relevant information is uh, analyzed in order to identify, to identify the benefits, but also the challenges in relation with the proposed solution. Uh, again, okay. So let's uh, first have a look at the major driver and the vital driver, which is climate change. Uh, climate change uh, involves changing environmental conditions, which have serious implications for both biological and chemical contaminants in food and water by altering their um, uh, occurrence, severity, changing the risk profile of hazards. And this in, in its um, turn leads to changing eff efficacy of control measures and also to increased burden of uh, food and waterborne uh, diseases. And so what are the, the, let's say the features of climate change and environmental condition change? Um, we face um, increasing precipitation, ocean acidification, sea levels, extreme weather events and temperature, and at the same time, decreasing water availability, water quality, soil quality, and um, salinity, soil salinity. I don't know, it's not moving <laughs> Uh, 
um, so we can see on this uh, slide that uh, a single, for example, aspect of climate change, uh, like raising temperature, can affect food uh, access, food across the world by increasing the incidence of infections by food and waterborne pathogens, by driving plant pests into new territories and potentially leading to overuse of pesticides. Also, increasing temper raising temperature can promote higher uptake of toxic heavy metals in stable crops and also can make plants more susceptible to fungal infections and mycotoxin, and uh, which can emerge and move to new regions. Um, increasing temperature is uh, also associated with expanded uh, harmful algal blooms uh, and affecting uh, that affects seafood safety. The um, uh, climate change has uh, direct effects uh, with increasing uh, occurrence of existing hazards and also indirect effects, which relate to actions to mitigate a problem. For example, plant pest or animal disease control may lead to um, a food safety risk due to uh, a bigger amount of uh, plant protection uh, substances used or uh, microbials to be used to uh, protect plants or in, uh, in, uh, in animal uh, production. Next slide, trying to move. It's not listening me, this presentation. No, oh, it's not moving. I don't know what's happening. Ah, there it is. Finally moved. So we will have a look at um, a couple of uh, foodborne pathogens, which are most, um, uh, let's say, widespread, and uh, they uh, cause most of uh, food uh, recall in international uh, food trade, like Salmonella, for example which has high uh, human impact, human health impact. And um, it is uh, estimated as a foodborne um, at 93.8 million illnesses, of which an estimated 80.3 million are foodborne annually, uh, with uh, one, 155,000 deaths each year. Uh, Salmonella has remarkable persistence and uh, uh, adaptability and in, is associated with a wide range of foods. And as um, uh, microbiological uh, pathogen is a Vibrio subspecies, which is responsible for majority of human diseases attributed to natural flora of aquatic environments and seafood. And mainly it, it causes uh, harm when uh, um, the seafood is uh, consumed raw or undercooked, and uh, therefore temperature uh, in uh, processing uh, um, have an important role. But also the raising temperature in the environment also has a role in the spread and of uh, this uh, pathogen. So if to speak about Salmonella, uh, let's look why. Um, the increase in temperature is a concern for salmonella. Increasing temperature, precipitation, and extreme weather events can lead to uh, proliferation and more prevalence of salmonella serotypes. Salmonellosis associated with increasing broad range of foods, uh, of animal, meat, eggs, dairy, but also of plant origin, like uh, spices, nuts, sprouts, fresh fruits and vegetables, and even chocolate. A bit related to persist in challenging uh, environmental conditions, and salmonella can cause also illness at low doses. And so salmonella already is a high di uh, disease burden, but uh, could even increase, could, could bring more harm, therefore uh, presents a great challenge for 
uh, for food control. Let's move to the next slide. Waiting when <laughs> my computer will react. Okay, so there are <clears throat> publications, scientific publications from different parts of the world, uh, which uh, um, confirm that uh, salmonella uh, prevalence uh, is associated with increasing temperature. And there are examples from European studies, from uh, studies in the United States, from Australian studies, and uh, in particular, the, uh, the study from Australia uh, tells us that uh, without mitigation, increasing temperature will lead to an increase of approximately 50% in the morbidity burden of salmonella infections by 2030 in Australia only. So it's a, it's a pathogen to, to take uh, seriously and to uh, to control, to identify and apply risk, risk management measures. Next slide, trying. I don't know what is happening with this. I don't know, maybe to present uh, for the moment without slides. Yeah, may maybe, I'm sorry, I'm maybe just you can take without them. slides. So yeah. uh, the next, uh, which I wanted to, to tell, it's that uh, there are also evidence about uh, the fact that the Vibrio subspecies, for example, in the last uh, 50 years have moved uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, um, let's say Asia, south, uh, southeastern Asia, and also from, uh, uh, from, uh, from um, North America. Um, they have moved uh, all across the, the world, and there are schemes about that. And uh, there are calculations and estimations showing, uh, showing for example, that um, the, uh, they will be an increase in the coastal areas um, suitable for Vibrio uh, by 38,000 kilometers of new coastal areas by 2,100 under the most unfavorable conditions. Also, uh, the study shows that, um, that uh, the anticipated extension of both temporal and sp spatial disease burden for Vibrio infections will uh, uh, have particular high uh, levels in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, also that the increase will um, reach the plateau and uh, will stabilize more or less after 2020 at uh, 1,300 million of, uh, of uh, affected uh, population uh, at risk. Um, so um, because of this uh, concern, public health concern posed by Vibrio subspecies, uh, Codex Alimentarius uh, have undertaken a risk management work by developing the guidelines on the application of general principles of uh, food hygiene to the control of pathogenic Vibrio species in seafood. And uh, this was adopted, uh, these guidelines was adopted in 2010, but since then um, as there was also emergence of highly pathogenic strains. It was occurring um, geographical spread of infections of Vibrio species in association with um, climate change and potential demographic effects 
on increased risk in densely populated coastal regions. And so the changes which um, are on the table and uh, which uh, should be made uh, as a next step in the, in the near future is to update uh, microbiological uh, monitoring methods, including molecular-based approaches. Uh, also to uh, collect latest data on new pathogenic strains their geographic spread and clinical incidence, uh, also to collect, um, uh, also um, to develop methods for detection and characterization of Vibrio species, um, develop novel methods and apply uh, remote sensing uh, based techniques, uh, satellite imagery and whole genome sequences which would facilitate predicting peri periods of elevated risk and better control the um, viruses and um, Vibrio species, and also to undertake practical interventions, including at the uh, pre-harvest uh, um, stages in seafood uh, production, and um, also at post-harvest treatment, uh, applying high pressure processing, freezing, pasteurization, contributing in this way to the reduction of risk of um, uh, vibriosis associated with the consumption of seafood. Other foodborne pathogens, which um, also are um, increasing in occurrence due to climate change, include parasites in fresh water, fish and plants, uh, then uh, it's increasing the um, uh, pathogen shedding, uh, increase, um, there is an increase in mastitis, uh, animal disease, and with respective use of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, microbials and uh, potential antimicrobial resistance rates. And uh, there are also some decrease in uh, some virus, viruses. Uh, we face also internal, internalization of pathogenic Escherichia coli and Salmonella in leafy green vegetables, increased fecal contamination due to runoffs and contamination due to splash and, um, and uh, flooding. Another, um, um, let's say, emerging risk is coming from algal blooms. And um, as, uh, as you may know, the alga, alga are a natural component of aquatic ecosystems. And the uh, blooms occur when certain alga grow out of control due to various environmental and anthropogenic conditions. Some alga produce toxins, which can bioaccumulate in fish, shellfish, and induce toxic syndromes in humans uh, when consumed. Climate change uh, is um, promoting and uh, supporting harmful algal blooms and uh, their expan expansion to new areas, mo most of uh, which uh, are not prepared to address the challenge of detection and surveillance. And uh, therefore, this presents a risk to public health and, and trade. In particular, and uh, one of uh, most uh, known, uh, let's say, um, uh, toxic and uh, uh, human disease uh, uh, related to algal blooms is uh, Chiguatera poisoning, which is uh, caused uh, particularly uh, by um, dinoflagellatis, and um, it is um, a, to a toxic substance which accumulates in alga, which uh, then are eaten by uh, small fish, uh, herbivores, uh, and uh, which in their turn are eaten by bigger uh, fish. And uh, in this way, um, the, the toxic substance enter in the trophic chain, arriving uh, on the plate of consumers. Um, it should be mentioned that uh, Central America um, is uh, one of uh, Chiguatera endemic areas. And uh, this is, has been documented and also uh, confirmed, published uh, by FAO uh, 
uh, in one of its um, uh, publications. Uh, and that's the um, hazard, uh, which is, um, let's say, expanding and uh, increasing um, toxicity under climate change are mycotoxins. Mycotoxins uh, already a big problem, particularly in tropical areas, and uh, temperature, relative humidity, and crop damage by pests uh, influence uh, fungal growth and mycotoxin production in crops. Uh, with um, the change in climate and uh, with um, worms moving to, to the north to more uh, cooler and the temperate zones, um, fungal species find uh, new uh, habitats and um, they uh, we face also like uh, increasing the regional the affected zones and regions affected by which are prone to increase um, increased uh, development and growth of uh, production of mycotoxins. Uh, in addition, inadequate storage and transportation infrastructure, especially under climate change condition, and also lengthening uh, food chain, increase the risk of production and dissemination of mycotoxin. Uh, heavy metals uh, are also um, a hazard, important hazard under climate change, because, uh, for example, warm uh, water and acidification increase the bioaccumulation of heavy metals in plants or uh, if we speak uh, to speak about methyl mercury in fish this is also uh, happening extreme weather conditions rainfall flooding flooding spread of toxic metals from uh, mining areas to food production areas and uh, increasing soil temperature favors the uptake of arsenic by, uh, by plants. Uh, another driver and trend uh, which uh, has been described in the Foresight report is uh, changing consumer preferences and food consumption patterns. And um, this uh, has been uh, drawn to the attention that there are different factors which uh, determine the consumers to change their, um, their purchasing and consumption patterns, including environmental concerns, uh, then concerns for animal warfare, uh, welfare or uh, health um, concerns. And um, the many consumers, they tend to, to become uh, vegetarians or uh, flexi-vegetarians, consuming less animal origin food and uh, opting for uh, plant-based alternatives. And this change in the consumption uh, pattern uh, may lead to, uh, to the ingestion of, um, to, of some allergen, unknown allergen, uh, or um, can lead to contamination of uh, new food sources. Uh, which uh, all this phenomenon uh, requiring establishing standards and risk management solutions, which uh, also especially apply to functional foods and uh, nutraceuticals, uh, for which uh, the benefits and, um, and um, let's say challenges or risk factors are not uh, um, uh, complete or uh, well described. Um, it's important to know to mention that, um, especially during the pandemic, and uh, there is also a convenience uh, uh, driven increase in uh, purchasing of uh, food through e-commerce, which uh, and this trend is um, is uh, increasing, and uh, e-commerce requires both infrastructure adjustments, proper storage, uh, warehouses, etc., and proper control, and um, a proper adherence to, to food safety and good hygiene practices, uh, but also uh, needs regulatory solutions. Uh, some countries are more advanced in these areas, having already legislation in place, 
and uh, which is um, which is uh, enforced. Uh, other countries are only at the initial stages, and uh, uh, more attention to to e-commerce is necessary. And this appears as one of uh, those uh, steps needed uh, for to address food safety challenges. Um, in relation to consumers, to, to the changes, uh, ch uh, to the um, cho choices of consumers and the consumption patterns, it's important to, to mention that uh, consumers' uh, food safety awareness uh, often is shaped by um, the information they search, they receive uh, from, uh, from internet, from mass media. Therefore, it is very important uh, to ensure availability and accessibility of information from trusted sources, uh, counteracting and uh, leaving less place for misinformation. Let's try to see if my slides move. No, no, they do. I am sorry for this inconvenience. Um, if when we speak about um, uh, food safety risk communication, um, it's important that, um, that, that consumers have trust in the information and also in, uh, in competent authority, in governing, uh, governing institutions. And this trust is uh, essential for effective food safety risk communication. Risk communicator should uh, actively work to demonstrate credibility, honesty, and care and um, uh, ensure that uh, food safety risk communication is founded on good communication practices, which include ac accountability and trust, openness and transparency, timeliness and responsiveness, uh, preparing, planning, uh, coordination, and cooperation. And uh, FAO, together with WHO, has issued in uh, 2016 a handbook on uh, risk communication applied to food safety, uh, where all these uh, principles of uh, good risk communication are described. And in addition, uh, this handbook has an annex where all uh, institutions and actors involved uh, in um, uh, food safety risk communication can find a survey, a mini survey uh, with several components, uh, very easy to fill, but uh, which uh, will help to understand uh, where your institution stands with the capacity for food safety risk communication. And uh, I um, encourage you to, uh, to open this handbook and to visit the annex one in the end and undertake the, the mini survey so that you see uh, what uh, features of uh, uh, your institutions, uh, what resources, uh, human resources maybe, what trainings, etc., uh, what actions are needed in order to ensure um, an effective food safety risk communication from your uh, institution. Um, another, another uh, let's say, a trend, a drive and trend, and described in the, in the Foresight report is uh, uh, new food sources and food production systems, in uh, which feature such uh, sources like uh, edible insects, uh, seaweed, uh, cell-based food production, plant-based alternative, and jellyfish. Um, in the area of uh, new food sources and new food production systems, the terminology was uh, flagged as one of issue, uh, which uh, um, uh, needs harmonization in order to have a more um, constructive discussion among countries, among authorities, and uh, also the, the, uh, having the, the agreement on terminology will also help with regulatory aspects. Uh, I would like to, to let you know uh, that recently FAO has uh, published 
um, food safety aspects of cell-based food, where the terminology aspects are explained, and um, as also the, the uh, way how uh, and the justification, the rationale uh, behind choosing uh, the uh, terminology for this group of foods like cell-based food. Uh, and also this publication includes the description of hazards related to cell-based food. And here attention not to confuse with risk, just hazards which, uh, uh, are not the same as the risk. So, um, um, you as, as professionals in food safety area understand that, um, that heavy, having, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, food safety hazards identified does not translate uh, directly that the respective food is, uh, is not uh, edible. But, uh, of course, uh, it's a matter of uh, keeping control and ensuring that this hazard do not uh, uh, transform or do not gain a high risk. And as a driver, or before going to another driver, I just wanted also uh, to draw your attention to the fact that new uh, food sources and food production system uh, topic has been discussed um, uh, in the CCLAC in uh, last October. And uh, it was mentioned, among others, that um, new food sources and uh, new technologies, uh, they, are, they are coming with uh, their own new challenges in terms of consumer acceptance, cost, social impact. And therefore, uh, they, there is a need for agreement among countries about regulatory models and uh, also technological advances uh, need to be coupled with social, cultural, and economic context and promoted by policy changes in order to be uh, successful. And here I would remind that um, at the CCLAC, uh, <clears throat> it was also mentioned or FAO, representative of FAO um, invited countries in CCLAC region to uh, think about areas of um, uh, in, in, um, that relates to safe novel food and new technologies for which uh, countries would need um, uh, FAO technical, uh, technical support. And now, if to move to next, uh, to next driver, and, and um, trend. Uh, it's about urbanization and uh, urban, urban agriculture. And uh, in this context, um, it uh, is important to mention that urbanization normally happens and at a more rapid pace than the development of infrastructure. Uh, then water supply and, and so on. So it is important to, uh, to um, uh, give due attention to good governance, mechanism, capacities, policies, financial support, and also infrastructure development in order to enable um, food production uh, in uh, urban and uh, peri-urban areas so that uh, safe and, uh, and uh, diverse food uh, is provided in a sustainable manner in urban, uh, for urban settings. And um, also agriculture with urban um, areas can meet local food and nutrition security concerns and reduce uh, food wastes and, and reduce environmental impact so it's worth uh, developing, uh, but uh, with a due uh, attention to uh, make it uh, on, uh, uh, in accordance with good practices and with uh, a good food safety outcome. Um, another driver and trend, um, which has been described in um, 
in the Foresight report is circular economy. And as a case study for uh, the circular economy has taken microplastic, microplastic, drawing attention that, um, that recycling the packaging is not straightforward uh, forward because um, there may be uh, also some uh, contaminants uh, associated and uh, it's important to have uh, appropriate regulatory framework, frameworks and underpinning risk assessment uh, uh, applied to recycling uh, plastics and, uh, and other packaging uh, for, um, uh, let's say, economic consideration and, uh, and environmental protection consideration and uh, to, to do this in uh, good, good safety terms. And uh, then uh, speaking about recycling, uh, we should uh, remember that uh, recycling uh, uh, do not refer only to material, uh, materials, but also to water. And uh, uh, I would like to draw your attention that um, the joint um, expert meeting uh, on uh, microbiological risk assessment has produced a series of um, guidelines, a series of um, uh, guiding materials, for example, how to use safely water in fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, what water from what sources and the characteristics, parameters, then um, how to use safely, safe and quality water in production and processing of fish and fishery products, and also how to use and reuse the water in processing and production um, and, uh, and production. And um, it's um, uh, this um, micro microbiological risk assessment um, uh, guidance, they, um, you know they are numbered, so you, you will find them. Uh, but uh, I will uh, share, I mean, the organizer will share with you the, my presentation. So you'll find uh, the links also, which I include in those slides, which I cannot, I don't know, my computer just uh, frozen. I cannot move the slide, I'm sorry. And um, so um, is the, the number of, uh, of guidance are number uh, 37, uh, 41, and uh, also uh, 42. Um, <clears throat> so it is all, all very important that in uh, those uh, uh, application of um, water, which, um, which uh, have direct contact with um, um, fresh, fresh produce, which will be used raw without, uh, without uh, cooking, without uh, as, um, uh, let's say, processing. It's important to use uh, clean, fit for purpose, uh, drinkable water. Uh, so uh, it's uh, very important to maintain safe, uh, safe water uh, throughout the uh, production cycle and to, to avoid a contamination through water. Um, another driver and trend, which is described in the, in the foresight is food fraud, and um, which is um, characterized like as an unfortunate and uh, uncomfortable part of agri-food system, which um, have double twofold burden economic burden uh, bringing economic damage to to consumers uh, and also unfairness bringing unfairness uh, competitive unfairness between uh, between um, let's say uh, business operators but also uh, food fraud can have also food safety aspects if uh, the uh, ingredients used uh, they uh, are not uh, they are not safe and of course for food fraud there are no easy solution and um, the regulation 
is a central part of trust building in agri-food systems. And in the end, uh, the, um, uh, the final call to eliminate food fraud uh, from agri-food systems remain with um, authorities, with uh, those, um, um, let's say, institutions uh, who have responsibility for minimizing economic damage and uh, potential health consequences and um, overall uh, erosion of trust in, uh, in the authorities. So uh, what is important, uh, the, the uh, publication suggests not to rush, not to, uh, not to, in order so to avoid uh, hasty reactions in case of, of food fraud and uh, estimate carefully what happens, uh, the reason, etc. And also, um, if there is a recommendation to look beyond uh, data as a solution and consider social variables as an uh, equally valid element to, to ad address food fraud. Uh, so finally, um, I would remind that the risk analysis framework is a central methodology which is applied in uh, food production, in food business, in order to uh, ensure the food is safe. And the risk analysis framework contains um, risk uh, management, risk assessment, risk communication. Um, the risk assessment of these new um, drivers and trends and, and uh, the um, new uh, hazards uh, potential hazards uh, related to these new uh, drivers and trends uh, require more, da more data, require more information. And uh, it is important to use uh, more environmental data uh, through collecting through satellites, uh, through remote uh, sensing. And it's important also to have research to establish correlations between uh, environmental conditions and, uh, and uh, foodborne uh, diseases, hazards and foodborne diseases. It's important to support the development of predictive models, uh, which uh, only are as good as data are, and uh, new insights uh, can support uh, risk, risk management. And uh, here I would like to, to let you know that um, FAO has had a, a survey, had a study in 2022 uh, together with uh, Vagening and Food Safety Research, where the uh, knowledge and the use, use of, um, of um, let's say, um, early warning, food safety early warning tools and methods has been um, uh, are uh, used by are taken and uh, used by by country. And uh, I wanted to introduce the the <clears throat> findings from uh, this survey. Uh, so the rationale it was that technology is developing at a great uh, pace and uh, good understanding how it can use uh, is essential. So the study identified the following uh, the following findings um, that um, identification of early warning si signals and emerging risk signals of food safety in food and feed is considered important but not always identified as a prioritized activity in many organizations or food business operators. Therefore, awareness uh, need to be enhanced on early warning uh, tools and methods. Also, it was uh, also um, a conclusion, a finding um, that, um, um, that software tools for identifying food safety early warning systems, especially for emerging risk of um, food uh, safety in food and feed uh, are important to know. And it's important to have uh, enabling policy environment, technical skills and the capacities. 
um, uh, and which currently are insufficient at the insufficient level. And uh, there is also uh, a general low level of automated data collection. And uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence are not implemented in many organizations. Nevertheless, the importance is acknowledged. The gap analysis uh, shown the following gaps. Uh, gaps in technical challenges, like lack of internet access, and then uh, also um, then, uh, lack of yes, technologies, like monitoring system, a large computational infrastructure, high-tech robotics sensors, drones, and limited access uh, to data. Uh, social uh, economic challenges included the uh, lack of coordination between agencies at national level, a lack of skilled personnel, lack of good financial conditions, and lack of supporting uh, practices. There are also outlined uh, gaps for different technologies, like gaps in uh, big data, gaps in Internet of Things, in artificial intelligence technologies, in uh, automated food safety warning systems. But I will leave that, this for your reading when you get the slides. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm sorry, they cannot be displayed. And I will remind that data sources, we need various to use various um, various um, data sources, such as sensor data uh, from uh, spectroscopy and electronic noses, to image data like satellite images, mobile phone uh, images, a text data from um, online media publications, also data food, uh, from food inspection and control, uh, including also whole, gen whole genome sequencing data, and also uh, data from uh, coming from food research and expert knowledge. Um, so, of course, uh, the future for, uh, we need a new approach uh, for um, uh, data collection and data analysis, and the countries uh, are encouraged to, to prioritize and give attention uh, to that. Uh, what actions uh, <clears throat> countries are uh, encouraged to take in order to address the, the uh, drivers and trends which has been uh, outlined in this, uh, let's say, in this uh, session? First of all, awareness is important. So it's important that we are aware what is coming, uh, what is at the horizon, and we need to uh, to make sustainable investments uh, and to strengthen surveillance, uh, to organize strategic monitoring and uh, food safety management plans, to apply them and to, to ensure uh, their enforcement. Uh, we need the new approaches to analyze increasing data volumes using tools based on machine learning and uh, international intelligence, <laughs> sorry, artificial intelligence, and promote data sharing among, uh, among um, actors, but uh, among public sector, private sector, and among uh, countries as well. To engage with stakeholders, we need to engage with stakeholders at local, national, global uh, level in order to harness expertise and resources. And um, a unified, unified uh, response to growing common challenges can be ensured only through integrated One Health and cross-sectoral approach, where um, together with agri-food agri sector, uh, and other partners, important partners are environment, health, uh, but also uh, finance. Finance. We need to assess and reassess considering the, the changing uh, environment. We need advanced knowledge through research, identifying issues and improving solutions. 
they should not be um, reinforcing the problem. And we should be uh, forward looking, of course. So um, FAO considers that foresight plays an important role in uh, identifying emerging food safety challenges. And it's important that every country uh, undertake foresight uh, exercise. And where necessary, uh, FAO is also open to, to help with increasing capacity for uh, foresight in, uh, at country level. Uh, another message which I wanted to convey in this uh, presentation is that FAO is well placed to collect, analyze, and uh, disseminate information uh, for, on various emerging issues from numerous, numerous um, areas. And it can also provide support to countries in implementing, as I mentioned before, their own foresight activity. And with this, I would close my um, uh, talk. I'm sorry, I could not. Uh, but uh, I am sending to you now, uh, Maria, um, the presentation. And um, in fact, I should send it through uh, we, tra uh, we transfer or some other because it's big. So I cannot send it through email, uh, but um, after the pre after the webinar, you you can uh, uh, also um, disseminate it to to participants. And I apologize again for this technical uh, incommodity. And uh, if you have some uh, questions, maybe we you are uh, invited to 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 raise questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Leonora. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and for sharing with us. With us now all of we this open knowledge. the floor. If you have any um, questions, consultations, comments, doubts, we have some minutes for that. Please go ahead. Consulta. In the meantime, tenemos algunos minutos. I have the first question. Mientras algunos levantan la mano, um, tengo la primera pregunta. Leonora, I have a first question for you. What can FAO do? What can FAO and Codex members in the region uh, can do to tackle some of the challenges that you presented today? And uh, how can they uh, get in touch with FAO? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, first of all, um, the participants are um, invited to to have close contact and communication with uh, FAO country offices where they exist. So um, this is one, uh, one uh, let's say, uh, compulsory uh, advice and uh, step. And uh, also, it's important that um, you um, <clears throat> participate in the process of the development of country programming framework. Each country has a so-called country programming framework, which is a kind of uh, a commitment and uh, a plan for uh, uh, capacity development and interaction of FAO with country. And um, it's important that um, institutions convey their priorities uh, and uh, they are uh, uh, they they are uh, uh, captured into CPF country programming framework because in this way um, it's easier to get funds for the implementation. So this I would uh, like to say. And uh, concerning uh, codex, the uh, codex um, standards, as you know, as there are two two way process is a process of uh, contributing to codex standards development. And for this, you need uh, country data, regional data, regional consultation, and you should uh, be in uh, close contact with the uh, regional coordinator for uh, Latin America and Caribbean, which is Ecuador. And we have a couple of colleagues here from uh, CCLAC. And um, also, uh, so this this is one way of uh, working with Codex, providing technical expertise, providing data for standard setting. And there is a second way, 
uptaking already the products, the standards which uh, Codex is developing. It means it means uh, um, standards, guidelines, and uh, recommendation and, and other text code of practice which should be applied at, at, uh, in the agri-food systems. So we, I encourage uh, to, to have a look at the codex web page, to look at uh, those um, standards, uh, guidelines, and code of practice, which uh, can be uh, useful for, uh, uh, as a solution for the problem which you may have uh, currently in your country. Thank you. We have another question from Gustavo Miramar. Gustavo, please, if you can turn on your camera for that. Um, yes, it's very important what gathers us here, Leonor, what ha Leonor has uh, said. I would like to say that uh, the pollution of uh, salmonella and uh, what about the microorganisms? For example, this type of pollution, uh, this type of pollution, physical and chemical, by pesticides and others, uh, it is in the primary production, right? And what we would need, uh, what about the guidelines? It would be good so you can give it to us to, uh, so this is something concerning our different countries. And um, it is part of the national of Bolivia. It would be good if we could work in this area, given that this is causing uh, problems with salmonella, as uh, Leonor has said. And um, it would be good. So, what about the good practices and the analysis of CESGO that we could do with uh, work that is operational here in Bolivia? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mirabal, for your question. Um, uh, I cannot agree uh, more that uh, food safety should start from primary production and uh, the application of um, good agricultural practices, good hygiene practices, and good manufacturing practices. They are uh, prerequisites for, uh, for uh, food safety, for eff effective food safety management systems, so that at the end of the, of the food supply chain, we have uh, safe, safe food. And uh, indeed, it's uh, an analysis of hazards. It's very important in order to know what kind of, uh, of good hygiene practices should be applied and what kind of uh, risk management uh, uh, measures should be applied in order to neutralize uh, or to minimize the hazards, the the hazards to the level uh, which they do not uh, pose uh, risk, uh, appreciable risk for uh, public health. I would remind that uh, good agricultural practices include in, in themselves, in them, um, uh, some part of uh, good hygiene practices, but uh, it's not enough because they don't bring always the uh, technological parameters, how to achieve food safety and how to, to uh, let's say, to, to reduce the risk of, uh, of um, hazards. Therefore, it's very important and I advise uh, Bolivia and other countries to look into developing good hygiene practices applied to different food subsectors because every food subsector has, it, has its own technological scheme, its own process, processes, and its own hazards. Therefore, uh, it's important to have good hygiene practices applied, for example, to dairy, applied to to bread making, applied to food streets, applied to, uh, to canning maybe, or applied to, um, to meat products and so on. So uh, this is my advice, uh, advice to you. Also good hygiene practices for retail, for, uh, for food service and so on. Thank you. 
the sake of time of Colombia, we have a couple of questions and then we will close this uh, part of the day. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, all. Listening to Leonora and leading, reading the report, I see that uh, she says that it is necessary to make new risk evaluations because we don't know about that. And uh, what are the implications that we have for this type of consumption and um, the food and the protection systems? The changes given these human, the urban spaces, the changes for the technological things and what we can do. We have to uh, do all these risk evaluations. Leonor already said that we need to find new uh, risk uh, measures. So I have the feeling now that after more than 30 years of working in food inequity, in food safety, the small knowledge that I have concerning this is going to be um, uh, left behind. I mean, I'm not going to be updated because all these changes mean an enormous change and the need to research and learn and, and know more to find new measures to understand what's going on everything that is posted here uh, that is posed by the report of the FAO. It's a, a, a full challenge and it is very interesting the, the presentation of uh, Eleonor for the young that are here. And it's a lot to do. We have a lot to do and uh, that is something, well, it was, more, it was more a comment than a question. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Jairo. Uh, for um, Romero for, for the comment and uh, indeed uh, the food safety is, is a, a continuous business, is a continuous process. We cannot stop because, for example, if uh, to imagine the body of knowledge as a circle, uh, which is bordering with unknown, which is outside, more knowledge we accumulate and more that the circle is enlarging, the more also is the border of unknown. So this is just a illustration, a visual illustration that if we advance with, uh, with uh, science, uh, with, uh, we advance with new technologies, we have more and more uh, questions also ahead of us. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for a lovely presentation, I enjoyed it. I wanted to know more about the food safety risk network that we have for our region and how it is going to help us in the capacity building for our countries to do risk analysis. That's one. And for analytic data, because we need this to do our monitoring programs. Um, both on the agriculture side and the ministry side, the food safety side. And I'm um, just wondering how FAO is going to have any programs in, in line or viewpoint, how we're going to attain this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for uh, your question, uh, Dr. Suzanne um, Glennon Miguel. Uh, I am wondering if uh, Marisa is online. Is Marisa connected? Uh, Daniela, do you know? She couldn't know, okay. Because we have a regional food safety officer which uh, is involved in this uh, food safety risk network project. I think this is a project which is uh, funded by food safety, um, uh, STD of standards and food safety development facility. And it's aim, it is aiming to develop uh, a risk uh, assessment capacities at national level and to, to have a network of specialists exactly for cross fertilization, for, for consultation and for building uh, 
let's say, not duplicating, but uh, building synergy and deciding uh, where to focus the resources and what would be the most uh, stringent problem to be addressed. So I am very optimistic about this project and it's very good that you are interested in, uh, uh, in this um, uh, problem. And uh, I would encourage to, to contact and uh, I think that Maria uh, from, uh, from um, Santiago, she could help connect you with Marisa and see how um, uh, Dr. Susan can be uh, involved uh, in, uh, in this project. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I will put uh, Isabel Marisa about the question. I will put, I will link the two of you. We have another question, but given um, the time constraints, Ani uh, from Peru, if you can write it on the chat, I would like to introduce the new presentations. Eleonora, thank you very much for being with us and for sharing your knowledge and helping us uh, in uh, taking uh, important steps towards um, better understanding food safety. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I would uh, uh, stay to, to listen also to the next presenters and if possible to participate with discussion, it's my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Maria and Eleonora. So nice to see you and uh, greet you at this workshop. Uh, we're going to continue now and we're going to welcome Dr. Go Claudia Guzman, who has 23 years experience in different areas in uh, medication, food, raw material um, safety. She is involved in the Codus Alimentarios in El Salvador. Osartec, and she has six years experience in this area. Thank you, Claudia, for inviting, uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, we are now sharing uh, your presentation. Uh, you are ready to go. Thank you very much, Daniela. I would like to thank you for the invitation and to be able to um, show you the contact point codex. And we hope to be able to share our experience uh, from Salvador's standpoint, uh, standpoint. I will refer a little bit about the challenges and uh, food safety in El Salvador from the uh, contact point, uh, codex contact point. Here we go. So I would like to give you some background about OSAR Tech, um, the acronym. It is the organization from El Salvador that uh, has to do with the regulation, uh, technical regulation. It coordinates, adapts, uh, updates, disseminates technical regulations uh, linked to the government. It issues the necessary regulations for the system's operations. It has technical regulations that must be complied with by the trade and other sanitary and phytosanitary measures set forth by the World Organization of Trade. It maintains updates, uh, makes available to the public. It has a database of the updated technical regulation and the process for the country, and it acts as a coordinator for the Codex Alimentarius point of contact in El Salvador. And it's linked, of course, to the law that have uh, that were passed in the country. I would like to give you some background now about food safety. El Salvador has had a, has been working from 2017 to 2019 in managing the requests for a project with the uh, FAO MAS uh, Codex Elementary support to be able to create a structure of what the national program uh, codex program looks like 
And in that path during those years in 2020, we were able to have the support of binational uh, El Salvador and Guatemala. And the project is called Capacity Building to Strengthen and Effectively Manage Contact Points, the Commission of Codex, the um, uh, Codex National Committees in the countries of Guatemala and El Salvador. In 2021, we, with the delay of the pandemic that uh, arrived by surprise, we wanted to couple uh, the emerging um, occurrences at the time. Uh, we face major challenges to develop or, or uh, put the project uh, in operation. So I will share the binational project. El Salvador, Guatemala. This has allowed us as countries to enter this process to cons consolidate our Kodesh national product, uh, programs. Without the support, the financial and technical support of, uh, code of this organization, SVNGT, and the binational project was to strengthen capacities of the members of Codex Salvador and Guatemala to achieve a higher uh, level than the current situation found in both national programs. We have analyzed to understand the level of the different areas where we, where we stood as a national uh, Codex program we created a great deal of on-site um, processes to take the right steps, focusing on the weaknesses that we had in this uh, and that we identified. Now we have eight results that were expected at the binational level, uh, which are the challenges we need to comply with. The first one is to uh, strengthen interregional collaboration between Guatemala and El Salvador. Through our commissions and committees of CODIC with the development of trainings and workshops. Through our experiences of El Salvador and Guatemala, then uh, our other aspect is to strengthen collaboration amongst the member countries in projects with other contact points of the CSELAC and countries uh, that are consolidated. This has helped us to achieve professional links and to understand what have been the success uh, stories in order uh, to learn from them as three, the Codex contact point and members that make up the domestic structure, uh, which comply with the functions of Codex and good practices of Codex. We should have a strategic plan at the domestic level and other uh, Codex technical aspects. As number five, our objective is to increase the support of the contact points through uh, institutions that are linked to the national program, subscription of an agreement or signage of an agreement on behalf of the authorities of health, agriculture, economy, and the office of representation to guarantee the commitment of the Codex Alimentarius National Program. And uh, we want to facilitate also trade. The results and all the management that we try to uh, present this for different countries, the topics that are being developed by Codex. And number seven, the Codex contact point, the members, 
must be technically trained and prepared to exercise all the activities that Codex requires from them. This has been a very hard task uh, in the last year and more will come because part of the training that we need to carry out uh, on our staff is fundamental. And the number eight is the um, work uh, development in government uh, institutions. Our binational uh, project uh, seeks to strengthen elements to have macro results. Uh, we will have 11 products and 33 activities. The number one is centered around the fact that we have consultation, communication, and decision-making process by codex. The results that we expect is that the contact point and the members that are part of the national structure comply with their role and have uh, understand the strategic plans of the national program and all those that support the good practices. We have four products that are triggered from this elements and each one has activities. I'm not going to go to that detail. Uh, we already have the National Codex Commission um, baseline, which is fundamental for all the activities that the contact point is carrying out. And uh, because uh, they are leading the process at the national level, we are implemented. It also, the national in 2022, we carried out the national plan by complying by 90% of the program. And right now we are executing the national program 2023 with uh, the goal of achieving our strategic plan. And the last point here is that upon concluding this program, we could transfer this diagnosis to measure consolidation and how the national codex structure has played out. The number two element is centered around the fact that El Salvador and Guatemala should have knowledge and comprehension of the work carried out by codex, the members and the contacts and the, um, and the uh, mirror committees of codex and all its stakeholders, government, industry, academy, and consumers are trained and technically prepared to carry out their jobs um, as, uh, and activities of the codex countries. This is focused around having this kind of training. In 2022, we developed a significant training and in 2023, we have already developed one and we have other types of program training, which will um, strengthen these competencies. Element three is centered around the fact that El Salvador and Guatemala apply um, uh, policies that will guarantee uh, codex at the national level. We hope this program is established and uh, in present uh, for the achievement um, of the welfare, uh, well-being of the population at large. Authorities of health, agriculture, economy, and foreign affairs should be committed to supporting uh, the codex elementarians in the countries. The, the products, the authorities uh, have to be sensitized to this high level. We need to coordinate the different uh, uh, high level authorities, health, agriculture, economy, the uh, offices, uh, and of course, the foreign affairs office. And of course, the um, from the standpoint of codex to be operational uh, and be involved in all these uh, uh, operations of the ministries, of course, that are involved so that 
we can generate this dynamic of sustainability on the national program. As I mentioned before, I have a summary of what this creation uh, looked like. Uh, this was a process in uh, 2021, like where we carried out different uh, workshops and we were able to carry out the strategic plan. This was a validation program um, and the uh, subscription uh, in person event uh, with the support of the ministry um, and honorary members that signed this plan. We created in we created two national plans which have been executed in 2022, as I stated, and 2023, which is in the process underway with different activities, which we expect to uh, comply with our project. In the strategic plan. We developed it based on the problem we identified at the national level after we implemented the tool. We carried out um, this process with the funds provided. Our main problem as a country is the scarce participation and involvement of, na of key national authorities in uh, codex to work in the proposal analysis adoption follow-up and assessment of the scope in compliance with codex uh, standard and to achieve the reduction of diseases transmitted via food or foodborne diseases as uh, was uh, to facilitate trade. Then we created the results uh, in order to obtain these consolidated structures. Amongst the expected results, on a long term, middle term, and uh, short term, which is the one we're working on right now. Our vision is to, within these results, we can reduce the incidence and severity of diseases that are airborne, that are foodborne, uh, a higher participation of agro industry products in the national and international markets with uh, employment and income for El Salvador. In the middle term, we have the adoption and implementations of codex standards at a domestic level, which are relevant to reduce the foodborne um, diseases and the reduction of costs and times and transactions. As you can see, this is a long path that the country is going uh, step by step. And we are very happy and optimistic to be able to carry out and, uh, and achieve the results that we have set ourselves as a goal. In the strategic plan 2021-2024, we expect on a short term to have uh, results in three areas. One of them is to improve the consultation process, communication, and CONACODEX management. Uh, in the codex standard compliance, a support adoption of processes, follow up and assessments of codex standards and reducing, of course, foodborne diseases and facilitating trade, improve and increase technical capacity, scientific involvement in understanding safety, food safety and our uh, framework is to be able to implement all these. Our strategic plan vision is to consolidate the Codex National Program in El Salvador through an effective uh, participation of all stakeholders in the creation and review of the food safety um, standard which is what we are working on. Now, as far as development objectives, we seek to increment 
the uh, player, uh, key players uh, to propose and adopt uh, the standards for Codex Elementarius in improving trade and commerce. We wanted to improve the quality uh, consultation communication for the proposal analysis adoption of this codex standard. We hope that we will be able to increment the participation of key players for this proposal and that we're able to adopt codex number two. What has been set forth has been reviewed and recommended uh, in and adopted by the uh, mirror committees and to support the reduce and reduce uh, foodborne diseases. And number three, by then we would like to have improvement of participation processes in El Salvador and the participation of international organizations around uh, the codex at the domestic level. This is the part of the on the research and uh, at a national level because it is part of what we're going to do because we're going to be focusing these uh, cities. Uh, so uh, we understand having a program positive in terms of the uh, food safety that is to minimize the management for the implementation of the standards for their nature it is part of the ETA and the commerce so everything on the researchers and everything at a national level international and uh, all these uh, facilitation of um, uh, areas this is part of the research, the follow-up, and uh, the basis to be able to uh, make uh, the ministries. This is part of the standards. This is part of the research for the evaluation of the social impacts, economic, in the application of the standards and um, sorry for the codex standard being able what this is generating and for the mechanisms um, for these effects economic for the implementation of these standards and this is so this is introduced for uh, the decision takers as a last area last objective here it is part of the scientific capacity of these links and uh, all the food safety for the proposal and the evaluation of anything that we should do. And for that, we have the standard to be able to comply the expected results. One of them is that it is able to update the knowledge, the technical knowledge of the different parties that are relevant of the codex and the proposal and uh, the follow-up of the codex standards. Also, it says that we have integrated uh, these uh, research for the codex of the food to be able to standardize uh, some areas that are uh, coming from the uh, some notions uh, for the uh, standard and the action plans. In the result number three, and the standards that are referenced at a national level, international and others, this is for the improvement of the processes of generation and the standards that are the codex. And um, the fourth one that are part on these research and uh, the standards, for the compliance 
of the resources that are strategic for the food safety. In number five, we pretend to have developed and viabilized the technical proposal that are financial for this type of research for the food safety and the standards of the codex. Um, so this is something that supports data when these are requires, requested. And uh, this is part of the standardized result that allows to systematize and exchange value, effectively speaking, and e efficiently in food safety. And uh, well, this is my presentation. This was my presentation for today. And uh, I hope this, uh, uh, this has given you the necessary ideas for the contact point that is the Salvador. This is the reason why we are here. And uh, this has a full uh, challenge to be able to comply and have this uh, happy compliance. So the strategic plan and everything that we have done, everything with the purpose to strengthen our plan our program, national program of the Codex. And so we thank you very much your time and uh, and the attention that you have uh, given me. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia. Good presentation. We're going to now go to the Q&A. If you have any consultation, please let me know. Raise your hand or you can write it down in the chat. Okay, so uh, let's go for that. Gustavo, go ahead. Yes, I would like to take this time of this easy luck to congratulate the uh, our colleagues, uh, Claudia in this case, and the advances that he has for the strategic plan and uh, as Bolivia and the strategic plan and the implementation of the committee the codex of Bolivia in this case. Nevertheless, we are a bit um, avoiding the difficulty of being able to make that, uh, meaning that all the institutions can take part of the POA for the different activities with the concerning budgets. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask you about the, this, uh, this requirement. How are you doing that? Have you had any difficulty in the implementation of the strategic plans? And uh, for El Salvador and Guatemala, I would like to know about that. But also, I would like to respond to know if you've seen here in Bolivia, we are having um, to strengthen uh, for the codex that are sustainable over time um, to strengthen this legal part or establishing the uh, food safety as a public policy that is and becomes a, a task of the state, uh, not as a private entity, but uh, it is part of the step uh, with the uh, TPA training. I don't know, Claudia, if you could please comment something about it. You're so kind, Claudia. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Thank you all. Uh, all the team is working to be able to perform this plan that we have uh, stated ourselves. And, and I would like to tell you about the experience uh, that we've been able to develop and the strategies uh, that we are developing for these areas for the project. Uh, on the tasks where we have uh, gathered all the different parties of the different uh, national sectors to be able to um, work as a group in a national plan. And uh, this opportunity in the 2022, we have developed, we have two days, two working days. One where we create a, a draft of a plan for the codex in El Salvador that introduces all the national parties. And uh, we give this room for uh, the modification, for the improvement, creating a roadmap 
for uh, all the activities that we are dealing with and add that, that uh, work scheme in the second working day, we are going to uh, have this yearly plan reviewed and uh, to make adjustments that visualize the members. And therefore we will be able to favorize us to be able to have some of these yearly plans as we have mentioning. So somehow all of this, all of this is going to give us this uh, support of all the sectors for all the activities that are posed. They're not the contract point. The contract point um, is the one that is going to be littering uh, for the activities of that. And uh, these are all the ones that are involved. These are involved. And thanks very much for all the awareness and all the effort and the sensibilization of this uh, 2021 that uh, we are starting to execute and we have had the support of uh, the different sectors when we gather the, the, these activities also to be able to, to execute them. So I consider that it has been key and very important the sensitization in the support of the authorities that has been essential uh, to be able to manage these plans and um, to achieve this compliance. Okay, this is the second question that is coming and uh, we have uh, here the legality and everything that we are we are we are being we are considering to escalate our rule of codex, code of codex at another level. And uh, and we are working all together. We can be part of that. And the idea is to have this conical rule for the level of the execution, and for that. Equally speaking, and in a ministry, we have two ministries that are part of the inequity of the food, food safety, the uh, and the assistant of the government, and also this has been essential for the support of the entities to be able to establish and be able to escalate this document that is the one that we're waiting for. So it has a necessary weight and importance to have that sustainability that we're looking for. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia. We have a, another question here. Which are the challenges concerning the food safety that have been identified and how the CARDES has been helping uh, to achieve that? The food safety is not part the codex and the area. What has been done? This is part of the Minsal. I could not uh, answer that question. And we are giving that perspective as a contact point of the codex that we are in the in this part of the area. I mean, that we are in this uh, situation. Thank you so much, Claudia, for your presentation. I don't think there are more questions. And um, it's an honor to have you here. And it's an important actor for this, uh, for the, the region. You are a very important stakeholder. And I hope we can keep in contact. <laughs> With this, we put an end to your presentation. So, Angeles, go ahead. Thank you so much, Daniela and Claudia, for this excellent presentation. Now to continue, we're gonna leave the floor with Natalie Gibson. Uh, she's a technical director in the food safety of the authority of uh, the DINSEC. And uh, 
the, she has been working in the food safety as an administrator of the laboratory. And uh, uh, she deals with the surveillance antimicrobial and the ad hoc codex of this year, 2022. So whenever you want, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you and um, happy to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, do I just share my screen? Okay, are you seeing it in full screen? No, yes, okay, great, thanks. Okay, so I'm here on behalf of the Belize Agricultural Health Authority and our Codex Committee. And just a little background uh, in Belize, where we're located, um, we're bordered by Mexico, Guatemala, and the Caribbean Sea. And uh, our economy largely based on tourism and agriculture. We're a very small country, a very small population, only 400,000 people at our last census. And in terms of our national food control system, we have the two major um, authorities are the Belize Agricultural Health Authority, the Food Safety Services Department, and, and uh, BAHA, which we call BAHA, which is the statutory body with responsibility for animal health and food safety, um, were established in 2000. We have the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and specifically their Public Health Bureau has responsibility for food safety. Um, the Belize Bureau of Standards has responsibility for standards, quality, and consumer protection. And we have the Pesticide Control Board, which has responsibility for registration of pesticides. So in terms of, I'm going to focus more on Baja and the Ministry of Health, our division of authority there based on regulation and also on MOU with Ministry of Health having responsibility for foodborne disease surveillance, certification of food handlers, um, food safety policy, um, inspection of food as retail food establishments, drinking water, and certification of drinking water facilities, food recall, and outbreak investigation. Uh, in Baja, we have uh, inspection of processing establishments, import and export certification, HACCP, food safety testing, veterinary drugs and animal feed safety. And um, there are a few things that, that probably aren't covered that we will need to, to cover in the future. Uh, so um, just looking first at foodborne disease surveillance where Ministry of Health, as I mentioned, is the lead. However, they do have a national um, committee and there's a national action plan and um, they have an, and we have support for implementation of the, the plan from the Caribbean Public Health Agency and PAHO. Um, surveillance is done by a clinician within health facilities and results reported. There's an information system, the Belize Health Information System, and the epidemiology unit within the Ministry of Health monitors trends in acute uh, cases of acute gastroenteritis. And investigation is carried out by surveillance teams within the regions. In terms of our challenges here with foodborne disease surveillance is that um, limited sample collection under reporting. Uh, the 2012, which is 11 years ago, so it's a pretty old study, estimated that only one in four cases of acute um, gastroenteritis were reported. And that number goes e even less when you look at cases for which uh, samples were collected and tested at the clinical labs. So there's uh, very few data linking foodborne disease to a few food source. And in general, um, there is a, yeah, one of the limitations is timely investigation for foodborne disease outbreaks. There tends to be a larger focus on 
controlling the outbreak than in uh, finding um, the causative agent. Uh, so uh, one of the things um, our action plan would uh, address some of these gaps. One of the things we need, though, is high level support for its implementation. And in um, I thought this one was interesting. So this case of cigatera poisoning, there's been, I know, ongoing work internationally on this case. And if you had asked me um, some years ago, well, before 2017, I, I would have told you that we um, we don't really experience cases of, of um, cigatera. And for a lot of us, this was um, the first case that we knew of where we had several people affected from cigatera poisoning from consuming barracuda fish. However, um, if you talk to the, the people who are, are older in, in the various government ministries, uh, we find out that there are anecdotal reports of previous cases of poisoning. Um, so we had the clinical diagnosis and we've had we've had some recurrences in the in the years following 2017. Um, we were not able so far, sorry, we were not able to, we had challenges getting uh, testing of fish sample for cigatoxin. And actually we had finally managed through our international counterparts to locate a lab in, in, in Europe um, to assist with the testing. And that was actually going very close to when um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, so our samples were already quite a bit old, and uh, with the pandemic, everyone shifted focus. Um, so we've, uh, we have the, the clinical diagnosis, um, but we've never had detection of the toxin in a sample. And I'm very interested to see the output, um, the guidelines that should be coming out um, in terms of management of uh, uh, cigatera. Um, we don't have a lot of data. Um, we know which fishing areas were associated, um, but very curious to see uh, what impact. Um, I um, was very interested interested in the FEO presentation, looking at the raising temperatures, how that would affect algal blooms, and what we can predict from the future. Um, but we definitely need a lot more data um, in terms of um, in terms of incidents of cigatera poisoning for um, in Belizean waters in our seafood. Uh, so in EMR surveillance for me is closely linked to foodborne disease surveillance um, as when we're talking about the food chain, of course. And we had participated in a pilot study for the Caribbean region in 2016, uh, looking at the baseline proportion of salmonella and the antibiotic resistant profile in poultry uh, at two points, pre-slaughter pre and retail. And um, at that point, we found very little minimal multi-drug isolates um, in the salmonella that we detected. Um, that was in 2016. So how that scenario has changed until now, to be honest, we don't have an answer for that. In 2019, we worked on a five-year national plan for AMR monitoring in the food chain. We had support from ICA and the Ohio State University with plans to implement in 2020. Um, so <laughs> you might see a trend here uh, that the pandemic um, kind of um, disrupted our, our plans a bit because we actually had um, sourced some funding at the national level in 2020 to execute that, um, the first year of the plan at least. Um, and again, everybody got diverted into, um, um, yeah, all, all the measures um, with the COVID pandemic. Um, so we are now in a case where, of course, COVID has had its impact on our economy and we are looking um, now trying to um, catch up and see how we can uh, find funding to initiate implementation and see how things have changed since 2016. Um, and of course, we're not looking, that was a pilot study. We were looking over at pol only at poultry. We have a five-year plan now uh, where we're looking at other priority commodities as well, looking at the resistant 
pro profile there. And we have the support of PAHO also trying to assist us to um, see how we can access funds to begin implementation of this plan. So shifting from microbiological hazards to um, contaminants and chemical residues, we have one lab in the country. So um, we generally consider it very limited, um, but um, we are a small country uh, with a small population and, actually, and we don't have well um, developed monitoring plans as yet. I shouldn't say well developed, we, we don't have uh, I would say enough monitoring plans as yet. Our laboratory is fairly well equipped and we've benefited from um, several projects. Um, there are challenges sometimes with, with um, budgetary uh, constraints in terms of maintaining those equipment and also um, just having that um, uh, those, those plans to, to provide um, sampling for um, the monitoring, food safety monitoring that we want to do. And we've had significant technical capacity built in the lab through IEEE technical cooperation projects. Um, so I I think at a meeting um, some months ago, I I was happy to report that we received our LC, our liquid chrom chromatograph tandem mass spectrometer, which actually um, would have the capacity to test for for cigatoxin, uh, were we to develop the method in country, we would have that capacity now to be able to do that testing. Um, we've also had training and um, here's just, that's a picture of our chemist who was uh, in Cyberdorf, Austria at the IAEA uh, food lab last year training, um, which was, uh, really great. Um, it, of course, it's time that she wasn't in Belize testing, and we have limited human resources, but the capacity that she gained was definitely worth it. Um, we've also received some sample preparation equipment for um, heavy metal testing under the 11th EDF SPS project for the Caribbean, specifically um, the component looking at strengthening fisheries and uh, the fisheries lab, so the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism and InfoPesca um, supported us there. And so basically, well, of course, we, we have all these equipment. We want to be monitoring contaminants and um, be able to look at a lot of those contaminants that were mentioned in the FAO presentation. So we're, we're limited right now in the number of monitoring plans. Um, we have been able to participate in regional initiatives at the OIRSA level, which is the regional organization in Central America for animal health and food safety. We've been able to participate um, there to determine baseline levels of priority contaminants um, in certain commodities. So in 2018, um, we participated with the other countries of Central America. Um, to collect samples for determination of the cadmium levels in cacao beans. We had uh, in 2020 arsenic levels in rice. Um, and so both of those, so we have some data there. Um, and ongoing, we're looking at aflatoxin levels in maize. Um, and so uh, that, that one is ongoing. We don't have the results yet. Um, in terms of the use of the data that we've that has been generated, we've also had some capacity building. Sorry, this is not um, this is in terms of the monitoring plans. I mentioned we had limited monitoring plans, and we've had capacity building to um, support us to design monitoring programs. The focus was veterinary drugs, but through IAEA um, regional project that we participated in, uh, which ended in in twenty twenty two. So the end point of this data, of, us, of course, we want to know what the risks are for our population in our food. So um, we, um, in terms of the data that has already been generated, we want to use it. And our staff has participated along with other ORISA member countries. Uh, we're trained in the use of the Simovina database for submission of monitoring data to GEMS. So 
our data um, can contribute to the international exposure assessments that are being done. Also through our regional project with the International Atomic Energy Agency, we acquired the at-risk software um, and we're looking forward to using it. Um, I know Orisa has conducted some training in, in Honduras already in using this software. And I know they informed us, the director of food safety had informed us that they've already um, looked at our data and analyzed the, the exposure assessment for Belize. And so we're looking uh, forward to our um, risk assessors uh, to learn how to use the software and be able to do those quantitative risk assessments also for, for ourselves and um, yeah, be able to participate um, more actively also when it comes to the international risk assessments that are that are being done. So uh, in, yeah, so in conclusion, um, we have um, some threats that we are aware of and some where there is not enough sample collection, uh, testing, data collection, and data analysis for us to detect trends. So we've had several projects to build capacity in those areas. Um, sustainability is an issue, but um, we have those capacities and uh, we, one of the things we need to do is sensitize um, our stakeholders, sensitize consumers. Um, the data we do have, we need to use, again, sensitize the consumers, make them aware of the food safety threats. So we can have the high level support to implement uh, more, more food safety monitoring programs. And also we need to improve our international engagements of our food safety professionals in CODEX. Um, last year, we were able to do that significantly um, because of the online, um, but even it's, it's still limited. It's something we still want to in increase. We need to improve. And um, we're looking at opportunities to do that. And so um, thank you very much for your attention. Yes, congratulations, Natalie, for your excellent presentation. And I would like to ask uh, with a scientific uh, mind, in Bolivia, we've had an attack of, of, of uh, polio, uh, of chickens, poultry died extensively in Bolivia. We have a crisis of of the uh, poultry industry. And so my question is the following, dear Natalie, from your scientific standpoint, could we say that there might be an interrelation between the antimicrobial resistant and avian flu? Uh, that would be my concrete uh, question. Thank you. Sorry, uh, what did the chickens uh, I, I didn't understand what was the cause of the mortality in uh, the chickens. Uh, okay, sorry, avian influenza. Okay, I will have. Uh, to... Okay, okay. Oh, uh, the avian avian uh, flu. Yes, okay. Um, yes, to be honest with you, avian influenza is really more the expertise of our veterinarians. So we're looking mostly at in at foodborne pathogens and we're looking at antibiotics. Um, in terms of the avian influenza virus, I I would say that I I um I, I don't see what pressure um anti I, I suppose um I'm not seeing what what pressure um, antibiotics would reserve would, would um, exert since they're bacterial they're they attack bacteria um, based on their 
uh, chemistry. But um, but again, um, yes, I would I would leave even influenza to the to the veterinarians. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I didn't see any more questions in the chat. Okay, there are no further questions. Thank you, Maria, Natalie. We are concluding today's uh, presentations. We'd like to thank our panelists and participants for this excellent day. Before uh, we leave, we would like to have a picture of all of you at this event. We'd like to invite you to continue participating in our webinars. The next one is the 7th of July, module four, the application of codex with regional experiences with dates to comply with on the fifth food-based on one system. So turn on your cameras, please, so that we can take an image of this event. It's six pages worth, it's six pages worth of images. So please be patient. First picture, smile. We're going to the next page. Don't forget to smile and turn on your cameras. All right, we're all set. Thank you very much. And stay tuned to our, our social networks. We will uh, share the presentations by Cicelac. The recordings will also be shared with the uh, on the FAO page. And I will send the contact points of Codex of all the countries in the region so that you can review it and you can extend them to those that were not able to participate. Without further ado, we will see you on the 7th of July. Goodbye, thank you. Bye-bye.